Sibylline Oracles, Book 1. The creation account is presented through a Greek worldview. The Sibyl writes that it was he who created the whole world, saying, Let it come to be, and it came to be. For he established the earth, draping it around with Tartarus, and he himself gave sweet light. Genesis 1, 1 through 3 is similar in style. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was upon the surface of the deep, and the spirit of deity was moving over the surface of the waters. Then deity said, let there be light, and there was light. Interestingly, it seems as if the Sibyl's use of Tartarus and the rabbinic understanding of the deep, formless, and void, Tihom, Tohu, Bohu, are interrelated too. Tartarus is the place of the punishment in Greek mythology akin to hell. Although the triad of pre-creation terminology, Tihum, Tohu, and Bohu, does not explicitly relate to hell at any point in the Hebrew Bible, a concept already elusive in it. There are traditions which connect the Tahu and the Bahu to Tartarus. In Midrash Rabha, classic rabbinic literature commenting on various aspects of Genesis, Rabbi Judah ben Simon, Rabbi Judah son of Simon, relates the deep things to Gehenna, a term for hell. So there is some sort of continuity between the tradition of deity draping it around with Tartarus in Book 1 of the Sibylline Oracles and Jewish thought of the period. Although this is an incredibly brief underexplored and not well-explained idea, it may be a possible route for studies in the relationship between rabbinic literature and Jewish pseudepigrapha. Revelation, <laughs> Revelancy 22, Contemporary Christianity, Post-Evangelic Topics and Theology. The Sibylline Oracles of the pseudepigrapha, Part 1. The Jenner of the Sibylline Oracle is well known in the ancient world. The Sibyl is always an elderly woman who delivers strange sayings as if from the gods. Ovid tells the story of a woman who asked Apollo to live as many years as there are sands on the seashore. The wish was granted, but she did not ask the deity to keep her from aging. So she is forced to live as a shriveled old hag. That's where we get the idea of the old witch. And you consulted the witches, the witches of Windor and these kinds of individuals. They were considered old, aged women. And they wore black robes. So, yes, a witch is where we originally got the Bible, as we will show. So she is forced to live as a shriveled old hag. Various cultures have versions of this story. The Jewish legend calls her Sabi or Sambeth and made her a daughter of Noah, the original Sibyl. I mean, the Sibyl is worldwide. It's actually not really known by too many people, even though it is the meaning, it is the intent of all of history and everything we have. See, history's broken up so much. You've got all this Greek mythology. You've got these histories. You've got this... You can't just sit down and say, okay, let me read this and then I know what the truth is because you go into it thinking, oh, this is mythology. Though this isn't true. This is a story. We're talking... This is a poem. Ha! Ovid wrote a poem. No. Ovid wrote the history of the world. And inspired utterances written in prose, which is scripture, like Psalms and Ecclesiastes, and the priest would write it, it's what it meant. It was holy scripture, and it taught us about the gods who are the people from Adam all the way down to Noah and his three sons, and down to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the 12 tribes of Israel or the 12 Olympians, and on and on. And this is the same story they have in, in every country. But 
everybody talks about the sibyls. The Hebrews talk about them. They even tell you in the New Testament that we get our information, our prophecy from women, but that they should not do anything other than prophesy, but that it was the man, which was the priesthood of the 12, that were men, and they were married too, and they had to become priests jointly with their wives, but the Flamins, which, what is a Flamin? Remember the 120 that was in the upper room and got the Flamin? They got prophecy, the flame, and that never went out until 395 when the Visigoths and the Lombards, the Herlews and the Vandals came down and wiped out Rome. And then, and they couldn't take Christianity. They just got the, the political offices and, you know, their armies surrounded them. But they didn't want to destroy it. They wanted to take it over, infiltrate it. They just came in and they put in certain kings or Stoics or philosophers to con it took them hundred years or more to influence and then they brought in Arianism from the Byzantine Empire and it was directly opposed to the original Christians that were there like Valentinius and the and the Gnostic Christians that were in Rome but they became outnumbered eventually because the the, the Roman Empire split in two and you have these Athanasian creeds and different creeds. Well, you think, well, they didn't agree, Dave. See, they're all Gnostics. They're pagans. They're heretics. No, they weren't. They were the, the low, they were the Italian French church, the original church. The ones that didn't agree were the Arians and came down and they were Vikings and um, Lombards and Visigoths and of these particular Germanic tribes, though they couldn't fight and take over our heroic knights. They couldn't beat them. They did. It was just too bloody. It was. It was like a stalemate. Same thing happened here in America. So they just began to infiltrate and put propaganda and institute institutions or burn down institutions or, or, or lie to the people or create philosophies and, and detour people from having truth, lure them in by sin, whatever you could do to destroy the people. This is really a spiritual war between Satan and Jesus that Jesus is going to win because he's planted the seed in your heart, friends, and you're not going to fail. But the Sibyl is the way that prophecy comes. And the Apostle Paul talks about it. They would speak in the tongue of angels. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. There were many Sibyls by the 4th century BC, but by the 1st century BC, the most important was the Roman Sibyl. Her sayings were kept in Rome and consulted in times of crisis. These books were destroyed in 83 BC when the temple of Jupiter was burned. When it was rebuilt in 76 BC, Sibylline books from all over the empire were brought to Rome to be housed at the temple. Roman Sibylline texts were filled with omens and prodigies, so too the Jewish oracles. When something strange happened, the oracles were scoured to give potential meaning to the event. The books could function as propaganda since a king could confirm his actions by pointing to an arcane civiline line which predicted his birth or some other key event. The obscurity of these works made them easy to manipulate and fabricate. Eventually, Augustus destroyed thousands of Roman oracles because he considered them politically subversive. The collection of oracles titled Sibylline Oracles in most collections of the Pseudodepigrapha are Jewish or Christian creations which mimic the style of Roman oracles 
in order to provide more additional validity to Jewish or Christian worldviews. You notice what they did there? They're interpreting this for you. They won't tell you what some of what we're reading here is true. It's just facts. But the interpretation of those facts, as they say, could be disputed, but very few people do because they don't know any of this to start with. They're reading it and they just think they're the expert and they must be, they're not lying, of course. Well, they are lying. They're, they don't, they, they know you're going to find out about this stuff. So they're going to interpret it and tell you, ah, don't worry about it. Don't, don't listen to it. They're going to steer you off base. So the reason why these other ones are Jewish or Christian oracles, you might think, oh, well, then they're not all the same thing. People are mimicking each other. Why would the Jews or the Christians mimic some pagan oracles? The only reason they're Jewish is because they have a different, you know, they're they're modern Christians at that time, modern Christians that talked about Jesus as a fulfillment of things that maybe earlier Sibylline oracles would have just been prophetic. And maybe in a different area where they spoke a slight different dialect or language and had different spellings of names, but it's the same spirit. They all accepted them as the Sibylline oracles. It says these Sibylline oracles are not a single work from any one time. No, because <laughs> they're making it sound like it's a work. Well, if they're not related, then they're just, it's just copycat stuff. It's all of the devil then. No, they're not related. What? They're all called the Sibylline Oracles and they use the same holy prophetess, a priesthood. Yes, they were in different times and in different countries because it was the true priesthood and every country accepted it because it was the ancient tradition back to Noah. And every king, just like we have kings in every country. Why? Because it was the lineal descendant of a branch of children from the father that thought they could inherit the kingdom. So they also had their prophecies that they believed and relied upon. No one would, would let you be king if you didn't believe in the prophecies. You couldn't even get the people to look at you as, a, as, as a, uh, someone they might listen to unless you were prophesied their book. So they had to accept the holy prophecies of the Sibyl. And the Sibyl was always a different woman in a different nation. It spoke hundreds of years later, a different nation, a different uh, dress code, maybe. I mean, there's slight differences, but it was the same priesthood. They understood that this is how it was to be done. And they provided a certain temple and costly jewelry and this woman was a queen. They respected her and made her life and gave her teachings at the colleges and gave her knowledge and all the things that were necessary for making it as easy as possible in her priesthood right to go into a frenzied state that's what they describe in all of these Sibylline prophetesses. They would go into a sort of a nystatic state. You say, well, that's ridiculous. I'm not going to follow up with that, Dave. That's satanic. Well, that's what David did. He started to dance. And, and when Saul went up there, he says, has he got the spirit too? Oh, Saul's following the prophets now. He's become a son of the prophets. Because why? He's dancing. He's an ecstatic behavior. And he's, he says, you remember at Pentecost, he said, well, these guys are drunk. And Peter says, we're not drunk as you suppose, but we're filled with the Holy Spirit. But they were dancing. But you see, who was dancing? The women would dance. The women would give the oracle. But it was the men who interpreted. And we'll see that here in the Bible. And we'll see that here in other places that, that describe this. But... Sometimes this is obvious since the writer is clearly referring to Jesus Christ. For example, in the 8th oracle, lines 217 to 250, an acrostic poem that spells out with the initials of each line the words Isos Christos, Theos 
with Sotor Strap Staros, which is Jesus Christ, Son of Deity, Savior, Cross. Now, this is an interesting thing, too, and one day we'll look into this a little deeper. There's so many things to look into and to pursue. It's, it would take a, a month Sundays, but this acrostic poetry seems to be something that was throughout all the Sibylline oracles, which means they're all inspired because no human could even do it. You come across words that make these very strange acrostics and it's all coded. They didn't have computers in those days. And all of the sibling oracles have this. We find out that now that we've discovered this, that most of the holy writings have this. And I'd like to go through the scriptures and look for these myself in the New Testament. Acrostic poems that you use as a coded way to make a hidden message in an otherwise normal passage of scripture. But other times it's possible that we may have a vague reference to a messianic figure or a messianic age, which could be either Jewish or Christian. For example, in Oracle 3, some elements seem Jewish, such as lines 5, 7, 3. Well, of course, like in the New Testament, they're talking about ancient times. They're quoting it because it's Holy Scripture. These guys are clueless. Well, anyway, it says, There will again be a sacred race of pious men who attend to the counsels and intentions of the Most High, who fully honor the temple of the great deity. But a few lines later, there is a description of a restored kingdom, which sounds like Christian descriptions of a millennium. And then deity will give great joy to men, for earth and trees and countless flocks of sheep will give to men the true fruit of wine, sweet honey, white milk, and corn, which is the best for all the mortals. (laughs) <laughs> Many times these either or sections are not important praises of deity, for example, but in eschatological contexts, it is very difficult to tell the Jewish from the Christian. Yeah, because it, <laughs> they were because they were Christians quoting from ancient scriptures. This is the case because early Christian eschatology is very similar to Jewish eschatology. Duh. Since both developed out of the Hebrew Bible. Isn't that interesting? Well, they finally figured it out by the time they got done with the paragraph. But anyway, it says, because the books of the Sibylline oracles are from different periods, it is necessary to briefly note the date and the provenance for each. You see that skull in that painting on the left side? And there's a wand in a book. That skull. This is an ancient painting that's depicting these mysteries that skull is the head of John the Baptist I know but now take a look at the woman she's looking first of all into a crystal ball so she is a a medium and she's not just anyone remember the cave that you know there's a cave we'll talk about where one of the Sibyls would go and and they would get communication from the Lord from there at the cave. Well, it refers to the cave that Mary Magdalene was in. But notice that the woman in the red dress is pregnant. You see, they're giving you clues in these early paintings that Mary Magdalene had a child with Jesus Christ. Yeah. We'll talk about that sometime soon. Sibylline Oracles, books one through two, the first two books of the Sibylline Oracles form a unit. Lines one, three, two, three are a Jewish oracle which begin to recount the ten generations of human history. The first seven periods are covered in this section, but lines three, two, four to four hundred are clearly Christian after a brief transition. And it finish the 10 generations theme, the 8th and ninth generations are missing. It is Jewish, but there are a number of lines which are Christian. The Jewish section of the book has been dated from 30 AD to 250 based on the dominance of the Roman text. There is no reference to the fall of Jerusalem, nor to Nero's myth. So they're having a hard time interpreting this, probably because of some insistence on 
keeping their false heretic views. Sibylline Oracles were probably a conclusion to another book. The main book with an Oracles Against the Nations section inserted in 350. The main section expects deity to interview. Delphi Prophetess in Christian Tongues. Did the ancient Greek prophetesses, especially the Pythian priestesses in Delphi, that's in Greece, speak in tongues, and the Christians later adapted it? The alleged connection between the two is an important one in the speaking in tongues debate, a dispute which this article seeks to look deeper into. The approach used to find an answer is to locate the primary Hellenistic texts that make this connection and evaluate them. All right. The Greek prophetesses and glossolalia. The Christian doctrine of speaking in tongues has had three significant movements over the 2,000 years. The first one was the traditional one that lasted for 1,800 years, that it was either a miracle of speaking, hearing, or both. The second one was far smaller in influence. It began after the Reformation, called cessationism. This is a conservative Protestant faction that believes all miracles had ceased in the earlier church and thus, any practice of speaking in tongues is false. This doctrine continues today. A third movement sprung up in the 1800s through the agency of German Protestant scholars who used a groundbreaking methodology called higher criticism to interpret speaking in tongues. This interpretation resulted in a new doctrine called glossolalia. Instead of tracing the Christian history of speaking in tongues, through a church literature and ultimately ending up at Pentecost, higher critics took an entirely different path. All right, great. The connection between ancient Greek prophetesses and glossolalia. Aristophanes in 446 to 386 BC was one of the premier Attic Greek comedic playwright and poets the highly controversial Johannes Bem, contributor to the section on tongues in the highly influential theological dictionary of the New Testament, cited Aristophanes' work, Frogs, to reinforce his argument that speaking in tongues was a syncretism with Hellenism. Here is the quote that contains the use of the tongues from frogs. In Corinth, therefore, glossolalia is an unintelligible ecstatic utterances one of its forms of expression is the muttering of words or sounds without interconnection or meaning. Parallels may be found for this phenomenon in various forms and at various periods and places in religious history. In Greek religion, there is a series of comparable phenomenon from the enthusiastic cult of the Thracian Dionysius with the divinatory manticism of the Delphic Phrygia of the Bassides, of the Sibyls, etc. Ian Johnson has provided a recent translation. The ones who've never seen or danced the noble muses' ritual songs or played their parton bacchic rites of bull-devouring Cratinus. Aristophanes references Cratinus, a master of Athenian comedy, uh, a bull devourer. It is a hyperbole about Cratinus, comedic talent. How this applies to the Delphic tongues or anything remotely connected to ecstasy is hard to grasp. Uh, perhaps Bem is building from the quotations of frogs found in Plutarch's Moralia in the section title, Were the Athenians More Famous in the War or in Wisdom? Plutarch gives some extra context preceding the passage at hand. Then, from this entrance, let the poets approach, speaking and chanting to the accompaniment of flutes and lyres. The closest association to anything referring to ecstatic utterances is adontes, which primarily means to sing or chant. It can also mean to intimate the sounds of animals or objects, like mimic them. The context here strongly suggests singing or chanting, and even if it did refer to imitation of other animals or objects, it still does not correlate to Delphic or Christian tongues. 
The Histories of Herodotus is now considered the founding work of history in Western literature written in 440 BC in the Ionic dialect of the classical Greek. The history serves as a record of the ancient traditions, politics, geography, and clashes of the various cultures that were known in Western Asia, Northern Africa, and Greece at the time. Although not a fully impartial record, it remains one of the West's most important sources regarding these affairs. Herodotus refers to the ancient Delphian prophetesses speaking in hexameter verse that was clearly spoken. One can find the actual citations in the footnote, and there is nothing in any of them that relates in there to tongues or speech. Plato is one of the most revered Greek writers and philosophers of all time. He lived in the 4th century BC. If one wants to substantiate any Greek theme and Plato supports it, then the argument has a winning probability. In the case of an ancient Greek priestess speaking ecstatically in his work, there are only two close references, and these are not substantial, but there is references to reinforce that fact. The Phaedron. Plato's Phaedron is rich and enigmatic text that treats a range of important philosophical issues, including metaphysical, philosophy, love, relation to language and reality, especially in regard to practices of rhetoric and writing. Well, he says, and the priestesses at Dodona, when they had been mad, have conferred many splendid benefits upon Greece, both in private and public affairs, but few or none when they have been in their right minds. And if we should speak of the Sibyl and all the others who prophetic inspiration have foretold many things to many persons and thereby made them fortunate afterwards, anyone can see that we should speak a long time. And it is worthwhile to adduce also the fact that those men of old who invented names thought that madness was neither shameful nor disgraceful. <laughs> oh, Timaeus one of Plato's dialogues, mostly in the form of a long monologue given by a little character, Timaeus of Locri, written in 360 BC. The work puts forward speculation on the nature of the physical world and human beings. Plato is describing how the human mind can touch the divine. He believed a normal, rational mind cannot connect and must be in an altered state to do so. Whatever vision, apparition, or speech that occurs in an altered state must be interpreted by a person of a stable or rational mind. Now, that's very interesting. Keep that in mind because, remember, Paul talks about interpretation. If, if you speak in a tongue, there must be there one who can interpret. Well, if the person speaking in the tongue can't interpret, then how are they going to interpret? Well, because the sibling oracle ladies were not interpreting it. They only spoke it. They were in a static you know, frenzies. And therefore, it was the men that stood by that spoke. So Paul would not have the women speak because they're just speaking. They don't know what it means. They're just in some frenzied state. But the men are the ones who teach. So it's actually not to speak, but to teach. And this is the, prop, the, the whole thing. There was these 12 virgins who would prophesy and there was the 12 flamens. That's the flame of the Holy Spirit, the interpretation. So they work together. It's a male and female thing. It was the feminine and the masculine, the thinker and the observer. This is a secret for anyone to receive prophecy, whether you're male or female. You see, this is just as all the other principles in the Bible, as above, so below. What is true of heavenly things is true of things that are earthly. And also, those same things are true in relationships or in other aspects, many different layers and aspects. It can be likened to the stars or various things. But starting out with just the relationship of a man and a woman, how is it that two equal different halves who think differently and one is male, one is female and they have different likes and tendencies but yet seem to be attracted 
But what is it then that they need to make certain that they are happy or optimal? Well, that's the part that is usually going wrong in our society. The men, they think they're the boss. And they want to rule it over the other side and control them. And this means that the other side, and they do that out of insecurity or lack of knowledge. They're maybe jealous or lonely or, or, or something negative. But to compensate, they may want control. And this is because they want the woman to love them. But love can only be given willingly. So if you want to know what's the best avenue to go forth here in society, it would not be whatever the men who were the strongest chose to do. That would lead us down a path where the women would become very unhappy. And if the women were unhappy, I guarantee the men are going to be much more unhappy. Because you see, the man can't never find happiness by forcing the woman. Ever. But when he learns that his part of the arrangement might be the actual doing or the physicalness of it, but it can't never be done or satisfy the whole without the participation of the female, which is by divine nature where we need to listen, where we need to find the truth. It's the application of truth that goes to the man. So the man is more brute and has more muscular strength, does more of the labor. Who is the servant and who is the master when you have dogs and they're in your lap and you're braiding their hair and feeding them out of a porcelain cup? and picking up their poo-poo and stuff for them. You see, there's an equilibrium in society, and nobody is really anyone's boss. We're all working together. But all of these principles that I'm talking about reach their height in the principle of the man and the woman, or the duality of good and evil, and up and down and left and right in this world, and decisions and discerning between spirits. And... The way then that a relationship works is that the man must listen to his woman and interpret it for the family. However, how does that seem fair? If the man could just do whatever he wants anyway, maybe he won't really listen. You see, like, how about these prophecies? If the men were the interpreters, how do we know that they interpreted it correctly? Maybe the prophecies coming from the women was completely different than what the men were saying. Well, you can do that. Even the women could not fulfill their side of the bargain. The women could uh, turn the cold shoulder. They might even go sleep on the couch. But I'll tell you, if you don't have that flow, the family will be very unhappy. It will be broken. And that doesn't just mean that, oh, too bad for the female side. No, it's really just too bad for both sides. Really, the separation. Because if the man thinks that's what's going to make him happy, to go off and do everything all alone and by himself, he won't even know how to tie his own shoes. And if he tries to cheat by manipulation or lying or these kinds of things, if the interpreters aren't interpreting correctly, then the truth or the proper guidance from the Lord does not get administered. And then comes the day of judgment. And that's kind of exactly what happened. Yahweh divorced his wife, the northern tribes, the Israelites, and uh, sent them a packing. Well, he says, where is my signature of divorce? What he's talking to the Judeans. But he did divorce the others. And Christ came to redeem. All who want to get their redemption through Joseph, who had the coat of many colors and became and received the promise of a multitude and the blessings. So when Paul says, I do not permit the women to teach, 
that's a specific Greek word. Certainly, it doesn't mean women can't teach. They can't teach their own children or their neighbors or whatever. That's not what it's talking about. We're talking about something other than just everyday life. We're talking about in the congregation, the women would prophesy, but they would not do the interpretation. Just as Jesus had said before, you need no man to teach you, but only the Holy Spirit. She will teach you all things and in the hour in which you need to know it. And you read how she beckons and calls to her children, her sons, to listen to her and only her because she has wisdom. And in fact, Jesus himself listened to her because he was the word of the Logos that was with the higher consciousness or Theos. But it was the Zoe, the life that was in him that would shine in the darkness. It was the Holy Spirit that was within him. He was with and in his father and his mother was in him. And that's what the, the scriptures teach. We learn by means of the mother's wisdom within us. And therefore, in the priesthood, they simply, just like Moses made everything according to the pattern, there were things that represented things. Now, a physical temple represents your body. So we don't need a physical temple because we have one not made with hands. So it was just a symbol. We don't really need physical temples. And oracles? All of us as Christians can be oracles. See, but what we're talking about here is the priesthood that's carried on because there are still people in the world that of themselves have no access to the Holy Spirit. And we're growing and we're learning. We haven't been initiated, some of us yet, into these mysteries. And we we don't know anything about Jacob's ladder and how to climb it. And so we do need sometimes to go to the elders, and that means those who have gone before and have their own testimony already. So it says, as good as they possibly could, rectified the vile part of us by thus establishing therein the organ of divination, that it might be in some degree lay hold on truth, and that deity gave unto man's foolishness a gift of divination. A sufficient token is this. No man achieves true and inspired divination when in his rational mind, but only when the power of his intelligence is fettered in sleep or when it is distraught by disease or by reason of some divine inspiration. But it belongs to a man when in his right mind to recollect and ponder both the things spoken in dream or waking vision by the divining and inspired nature. So in other words, you had to be somebody is uh, sub subconsciously speaking, receiving the message. And there had to be somebody there that could interpret or it was worthless. Because the person who's doing the dreaming can't do the interpreting, can't do the writing it down, being the scribe. That's why it was always men that were scribes. But it belongs to a man when in his right mind to recollect and ponder both the things spoken in dream or waking vision by the divining inspired nature. This is what they call the priests, augurs or diviners, the Roman flamens. To ponder both the things spoken in dream or waking vision by the divining and inspired nature and all the visionary forms that were seen by means of reasoning to discern about them all, wherein they are significant and for whom they portend evil or good in the future, or past, or present. But it is not the task of him who has been in a state of frenzy and still continues therein to judge the apparitions and voices seen or uttered by himself. You say, well, Paul didn't talk about that. Yes, he talks about the, the gifts of the Spirit. Well, that's translating the term spirits. Discerning the spirits, whether they are good or evil, and what they mean. It's interpretation. To judge the apparitions. Apparitions? 
voices seen or uttered. The voices seen? He could see the voices. For it is well said of old that to do and to know one's own and oneself belongs only to him who is sound of mind. Wherefore also it is customary to set the tribe of prophets to pass judgment. That's what Paul was talking about. The men will listen to the women and, I guess, interpret what they're speaking from the divine being. It was a symbol of the fact that our higher mind and our conscious mind have to work together. And the feminine and the masculine. And so it was put that way in the priesthood. And each side got a part of the work. The men couldn't do nothing or speak nothing or command anything if it hadn't been spoken by, in a frenzied state, by the woman who was closer and more intuitive and could perceive the voice of deity. But the men then, being the other half, could bring it into consciousness and apply it which is why it was always not perfect because the prophet himself may not understand his own vision perfectly, but the translation will certainly lie. But the point is, is that the truth is in that mindlessness where the higher consciousness speaks. And the only and best way to get the higher consciousness to speak is to let these women go into a trance. They were the closest intuitive of the pair of humans. They could reach the Lord and they had that part of the priesthood. Upon these inspired divinations, and they indeed themselves are named diviners, by certain who are wholly ignorant of the truth, <laughs> that they are not diviners, but interpreters of the mysterious voice and apparition for whom the most fitting name would be prophets of things divine. For these reasons, then, the nature of the liver is such as we have stated and situated in the region we have described for the sake of divination. Moreover, huh? Yeah, did you know that they would use the liver or the entrails of a goat, <laughs> like the liver, and they could divine by means of it. Now, we're not going to get into that part of it, but this was a science. You know, casting lots, using stones, astrology. This was done by the Jewish priests as well. They had oracles. These um, are kind of parables that they used to have in books that they called spells, books of spells or enchantments. And so mankind didn't understand them when they found them. And they thought they were evil people because they would take the liver out of a goat or whatever and they could tell you the future. And so people who don't understand that kind of thing think it's wrong. The problem is Jesus was the magician. Daniel was a magician. And they weren't slide a hand artist, but it was a priesthood. And even Moses could turn his staff into a serpent. But Jesus performed these types of things that we call miracles in the Bible. He'd say, here, he spit on some dirt, said some holy Hebrew words, right? And then told the man to go into the Jordan and baptize seven times or dunk, and then he'd get his sight back. Some of the things that Jesus talked about mimicked or harkens back to one of the books we have in the Apocrypha called the book of Tobit. The book of Tobit is a book of spells and it tells how to get rid of demons by catching a fish and taking out the liver and burning it in the fire. These are not intended to be ceremonies that we should perform literally, but the liver is that innermost being within you and if you can cleanse it by means of fire which usually entails suffering but the key thing is is through self-awareness then it can be purged these demons but 
Anyway, let's go back to what we were saying here. Remember, David went to a place called Nob, a city called Nob by Bethel, which had all the priests that were officiating at Bethel. It didn't say they're men or women. And they had an ephod and an oracle there. And by that means, the witch of Endor brought Samuel from the dead. So, moreover, when the individual creature is alive, this organ affords signs that are fairly manifest, but when deprived of life, it becomes blind, and the divinations it presents are too much obscured to have any relevance. Virgil. Now, remember we talked about Virgil. According to the Christian Sibylline oracles, which were originally in the Valentinian canon of Scripture, which included the book of John, and the Gospel of Truth, and Philip, and Mary, and the Nagamati Library. All of that was the original Gospels, the canon, the library. And in fact, we find that they had Platonic literature with it. So what was really the Bible? A collection of books, a library. And they actually went by the library at Alexandria that had all this information. So the, the original Christian Bible was an entire library, friends, it included the Vedas. Yes, there were Buddhists that were there at Alexandria studying and they were interchanging information. And, and they understood that all of these books were from the Holy Prophets. All of them. They knew that then. So Virgil was considered a prophet according to the Holy Prophetesses of the Sibyl. And he's the one that wrote the Aeneid. Virgil, or more accurately, Publius, Virgilius Maro is a first century BC ancient Roman poet. His alleged contribution to the tongues connection is small. Then to Phobius and Trivia will I set up a temple of solid marble and festal days in Phobi's name. You also a stately shrine awaits in our realm, for here I will place your oracles and mystic utterances told to my people and ordain chosen men. O gracious one, only trust not your verses to leaves, lest they fly in disorder. The sport of rushing winds, chant them yourselves, I pray. His lips cease speaking. That reminds me, you know, I did a video a couple of weeks ago where I went up to the top of this amazing cliff and it was so beautiful and I just, I love that. You know, half a mile behind my house up the top of the mountain there. Just beautiful. But when we got down to the bottom at the base there, I don't know if some of you remember if you'd watched it, but we, there was this amazing rock, like a pillar. There were two, two pillars standing together and a flat rock laying with an indentation at the base. It looked like some kind of a shrine. I mean, it really looks like a man-made, without hewn stones. No man put a chisel to it, but it's like a natural temple there. And it's interesting because I've been noticing it since I've gotten here. This entire mountain, I live in Red Mesa here, is a big temple. By nature, I really believe. Because I don't think anyone built these temples. But I've got a shrine at the corner of my property that is just this big, huge rock and natural rocks that come down and form a bowl and a place to put your message or your offerings or your requests or just to kneel and pray and burn incense or whatever. But this is a natural temple right here, I do believe. And actually, I know that it is very close in proximity, within just a few miles of the original, one of the original seven cities of gold. So I don't know exactly, but I think this whole mountain, this whole area is a volcano. I think it's sacred, but I digress. Then there's Lucan, the Civil War. Lucan was a well-known poet who was a friend of the unstable and often cruel Emperor Nero. This relationship that brought him to fame also led him to the grave. He was ordered to death by Nero for treason. His work, De Bello Civili, on the Civil War, covered the war between Julius Caesar and Pompey. The vital part of this work, relating to speaking in tongues, relates to his narrative on the Delphian priestess. He reported a story of Appius Claudius Pulcher, comic 
to a Delphic priestess to find out the future, possibly if he should go to war. The priestess named Thimoni faked such a prophecy that Appius rightly identified. Appius seriously threatened her and forced Thimoni to flee to the ancient prophetic cave. The inspiration the cave once offered had ceased for some time already. I believe that's the cave where Mary Magdalene was. In this instance, there was an exception. Apollo returned and filled Femino. She went into madness, raving, and uttered a prophecy. There is no reference to her being in a trance and uttering strange or foreign words at all for the sake of substantiation. Here is the English and Latin with which is the closest parallel. At last Apollo mastered the breasts of the Delphian priestess. Huh? <laughs> as fully as ever in the past, he forced his way into her body, driving out her former thoughts and bidding her human nature to come forth and leave her heart at its disposal. Frantic, she careers about the cave with her neck under possession. The fillets and garlands of Apollo dislodged by her bristling hair she whirls with tossing and through the void spaces of the temple. She scatters the tripods that impede her random course. She boils over with fierce fire while enduring the wrath of Phoebe's. First, the wild frenzy overflowed through her foaming lips. She groaned and uttered loud inarticulate cries with panting breath. Next, a dismal wailing filled the vast cave. And at last, when she was mastered, came the sound of articulate speech. Roman, thou shalt have no part in the mighty ordeal and shalt escape the awful threats of war, and thou alone shalt stay at peace in the broad hollow of the Ibuan coast. Then Apollo closed up her throat and cut short her tail. <laughs> oh, that's good. I love it. I don't know. This is interesting. Plutarch Moralia, one of out of all the literature referring to the rites of the Delphic priestesses, Plutarch contains the most information. Plutarch was a biographer, a writer who lived in the middle of the first century, 46 to 120 AD. His work, Moralia, explored the customs and lores of his time. His 30-odd years as a priest at Delphi may be the reason why he covers the topic of Delphic priestesses so often. A drawback to Plutarch's Moralia is that it is a large composition that would be a time-consuming to do a comparative analysis. Fortunately, an old series of publications entitled Moralia in 15 Volumes with an English translation are digitally searchable at archive.org. This archive was of immense assistant. assistance. A search in Volume 4 demonstrates that the office of the Delphic priestess was an important one in Greek society that required the prophetess to speak in direct terms. All the prophecies given were coherent and readily understood. There was no shadow of a strange or incoherent language being spoken. Well, it, it, it's not saying that the words shouldn't be understood, but they might be in some tongue of an angel or they might be the inspiration of an angel. But even there at Pentecost, they heard them speak of their own languages. So in Plutarch's letter titled The Oracles of Delphi, he writes that the priestesses gave prophecies in prose and meter. He also believed it was done in a formal, eloquent style. Here are some quotes that demonstrate this. It is very pleasant to listen to such conversation as this, but I am constrained to claim the fulfillment of your first promise regarding the cause which has made the prophetic priestess cease to give her oracle in epic verse or in other meters. Those who do not believe that in this time the prophetic priestess used verse in her oracular responses, afterwards wishing to prove this, he has found to support his contention an altogether meager number of such oracles, indication that the others were given out in prose even as early as that time. Some of the oracles, even today, come out in meter. Now we cherish the belief that the deity, in giving indications to us, makes use of the calls of herons, wrens, and ravens. But we do not insist that these, inasmuch as they are messengers and heralds of the deities, shall express everything rationally and clearly. And yet we insist that the voice and language of the prophetic priestess 
like a choral song in theater, shall be presented not without sweetness and embellishment, but also in verse of a grand, eloquent, informal style, with verbal metaphors and with flute to accompany its delivery. What a statement, then, shall we make about the priestesses of former days? And as for the language of the prophetic priestess, just as the mathematicians call the shortest of lines between two points a straight line, so her language makes no bend nor curve nor doubling nor equivocation, but it is straight in relation to the truth. Wow. How about Strabo? 64 or 63 BC to 24 AD was a Greek geographer, philosopher, historian who lived in Asia Minor during the transitional period of the Roman Republic into the Roman Empire. Strabo seems to retell the same story by that of Plutarch, the Delphic prophetesses would go into a trance, prophesy in verse. And these words then would be recorded by the priests. They say that the seat of the oracle is a cave that is hollowed out deep down in the earth with a rather narrow path from which arises breath and inspires a divine frenzy. And that over the mouth is placed a high tripod mounting with the Pythian priestess she receives the breath and then utters oracles in both verse and prose, though the latter two are put into verse by poets who are in service of the temple. They say that the first to become Pythian priestesses was Phimoni, and that both the prophetesses and the city were so called from the word Pythestai, though the first syllable was lengthened as in Anatos, Akamatos, and Diak. Konos. Michael Sellos, an 11th century AD Christian by the name of Michael Sellos, a statesman and lover of literature who lived in Constantinople, unearthed a different interpretation. And seeing that from the work of Apollo, the prophetesses, by the mouth the word follows, she became overcome around the tripod. She was pronouncing on the one hand to the Persians and on the other to the Assyrians and the Phoenicians, all according to the meter and also rhythm, which she had not known with beautiful language, which she had not learned. Friends, I want you to think about how close that sounds to what happened on Pentecost. They each heard, when they spoke in these tongues, they each one heard it in their own language in some kind of rhythmic, metered-out message. A perfect message from deity. And whether your language was Persian, Assyrian, or Phoenician, all that was standing there got the message through the prophetess who spoke in tongues and was in a frenzied state. Just like the witch of Endor in our Bible. Selos wrote that the Pythian prophetess was miraculously speaking in foreign languages. This conclusion is not consistent with any other interpretation. Pesalos loved... It's not consistent with any other interpretation? How about Pentecost? Plesos loved to play with ancient classical literature to parade his literary genius, but this does not explain why he would do this. However, he felt that this was not the same phenomenon as the Christian rite of tongues. Oh, it's exactly the same thing they did, but it's not the same thing. Yeah, yeah, sure. He believed the apostles controlled what they spoke. See, they're not understanding. They controlled it by interpreting it. Because these women were in a frenzied state. They just spoke what the Spirit told them to speak. And those who heard it, it was interpreted to them. Now, I mean, I don't know. This is something that probably happens slightly different in different places. Because unless we're robots, nobody's going to act the same way. Perhaps it's just the Holy Spirit comes upon you and whatever method you can find. I know personally that they're not even thinking about other aspects of this, which we know they did at the temple of Artemis and Dionysius. It, you know, Dionysus is about wine, right? Drinking wine. Well, the wine was spiked. 
Jesus gave them Mele, <laughs> Melissi, and that was a priestess. This was the priestess of the priesthood of the Essenes that were from the temple of Artemis. And they were the ones who had the sacred honey from the daffodils that produced this spiritual connection with the Lord. We've got Rhodes Psychic, the Cult of Souls. And we could go on and on. But I'm going to go ahead and cut it short there, guys. It looks like we're over an hour now. But I, we're just really scratching the surface here. Because I can't get into one video all the information. So we'll do as many as it takes. we got to understand not just our religion, but all the religions of the world needs to understand their religion. And I think it's all the same. I think we're all one. And I think we're about to understand the real meaning of the esoteric wisdom. Well, I want to let you go. We see you guys here tomorrow. May the Lord bless you and keep you and have a good day.